the list. Ten events that led directly to the Civil War. The following ten events are in order of occurrence, each becoming more violent than the previous, and each playing a role in the eventual dissolving of the Union and formation of the Confederate States of America. This lecture will be in two parts. Part one will cover events one through five, and part two will cover events six through ten. Number one, the Compromise of 1850. After the U.S. victory over Mexico and the U.S.-Mexican War, the United States gained a substantial amount of territory known as the Mexican Cession. As you already know, with the creation of the Northwest Ordinance, a territory must have 60,000 people living within the borders to petition for statehood. At the time of the Mexican Cession, California had well over 60,000 required people due to the gold rush of 1849. Therefore, California was ready to declare statehood in 1850, and President Zachary Taylor was ready to accept California as the next state. The only problem was that the Congress then would become unbalanced and the power would shift to the free states, as California wanted to enter the Union as a free state. After much debate in Congress, Henry Clay, known as the Great Compromiser, who had helped create the Missouri Compromise in 1820, which established the 3630 line, now developed a new compromise that would help settle the problem of California statehood. The Compromise of 1850 would admit California as a free state and place no restrictions on slavery in the remaining Utah and New Mexico territories, giving these territories popular sovereignty, which is the right of the people to decide through voting. Also, the slave trade would be abolished in Washington, D.C., but those with slaves within D.C. would be allowed to keep them. Texas would give up territory in New Mexico and Colorado, setting present-day boundaries of Texas, and in exchange, the U.S. would pay Texas $10 million. Lastly, the Fugitive Slave Act was created. Both sides felt they had to give up too much in this compromise, but both sides agreed to support the compromise to avoid further sectional problems. Number two, the Fugitive Slave Act. The Fugitive Slave Act was a law that would help slaveholders recapture runaway slaves throughout the country. Any person accused of being a fugitive under this law could be held without an arrest warrant and no right to a trial by jury. Instead, a federal commissioner would rule on each case. The commissioner received $5 for releasing the accused person and 10 for turning the accused person over to a slaveholder. As you can imagine, there were many more people turned over to slaveholders than set free. The law also required northerners to help recapture runaway slaves. It placed fines on people who would not cooperate and jail terms on people who helped the fugitives escape. In addition, southern slave catchers roamed the north, sometimes capturing free African Americans and forcing them into slavery. The Fugitive Slave Act greatly upset the north because they were either forced to support the Fugitive Slave Act and therefore play an important role in supporting slavery, or they would have to break the law and oppose slavery. The law impacted many, and abolitionists became more aggressive and outspoken in their stance on ending slavery. Number three. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a book published by Harriet Beecher Stowe, an abolitionist who opposed the Fugitive Slave Act. In the book, Stowe dramatically portrays the moral issues of slavery. The book's main character is Uncle Tom, a respected older slave. The plot centers around Tom's life under slavery. He had three owners. Two of the owners were kind, but the third was cruel. The novel sold thousands of copies. It became wildly popular in the North, but white Southerners believed the book falsely criticized the South and slavery. The book had such an impact on sectional differences that when Harriet Beecher Stowe later meets President Lincoln, he says to her, So this is a little lady who started this great war. For the first time, the North had their eyes open to the true cruelty of slavery in the South. Number four. The Kansas-Nebraska Act. While the Fugitive Slave Act and Uncle Tom's Cabin heightened the conflicts between the North and the South, the issue of slavery and territories brought bloodshed to the West. 
In 1854, Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois drafted a bill to organize territor territorial governments for Nebraska Territory. He proposed dividing it into two territories, Nebraska and Kansas. In order to gain Southern support, he suggested that the decision of slavery, slavery be settled by popular sovereignty. The Southerners supported the act, but it angered many Northerners. The bill was passed, and it quickly led to a bloody battle in Kansas. Number five, Bleeding Kansas. Pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers rushed into Kansas Territory to vote for territory, the territorial legislature. At the time of the election in March 1855, there were more pro-slavery settlers than anti-slavery settlers in the territory, but the pro-slavery forces didn't want to risk losing the election. So 5,000 Missourians came to Kansas, voted in the election, and then went back to Missouri. This was, of course, illegal, as you are not allowed to vote in state elections where you are not a resident. As a result, the official Kansas legislator became pro-slavery. In response... Anti-slavery settlers boycotted the government and formed their own. Both groups armed themselves for a fight. In May, a pro-slavery mob attacked this town of Lawrence, Kansas, with, where the anti-slavery group had established their state capital. They destroyed offices and the house of the governor. This attack was known as the Sack of Lawrence. In response, a man by the name of John Brown, who we will talk about more later, and seven other men who were abolitionists went to pro-slavery homes during the night and murdered five people while they slept. This became known as the Pottawatomie Massacre. As the news of the violence spread, civil war broke out in Kansas. It continued for three years, and the territory became known as Bleeding Kansas.